One of the primary objectives of, of this presentation was to partner the Cascade Culinary Institute at Central Oregon Community College with COCA, uh, the coalition, uh, Central Oregon Coalition for Accessibility, and to really increase awareness and, and knowledge for students how to better accommodate and serve those with disabilities within our local community, whether it relates with the educational process at Cascade Culinary Institute or service within Elevation Restaurant. So we're excited about partnering with COCA and bringing in some, some local uh, uh, restaurant patrons who are disabled and being able to provide some extra insight into how you, not only here at Elevation Restaurant, but beyond in your career path in the industry, can better accommodate uh, those with disabilities. So really looking forward to you seeing this presentation and, and learning more about how you can take this into your career path in the industry. Good morning. Good morning, Chef. You guys have had a great day of service-oriented learning today, I guess, right? Yes. Um, we are excited about this opportunity because um, as this has, has sort of taken off, and Joe, where are you? Joe Viola, who's our Director of Campus Services, as we began conversations in Open Elevation, we felt like this would be a great opportunity to help you all um, really better understand how to uh, deal with um, ADA, American Disabilities Act, um, policies and accommodation in the restaurant environment. So, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off. Um, let's give a round of applause to everybody who's coming to this speaking. Thank you very much to Chef Fritz. Um, I appreciate your introduction. Also, uh, also, I'll do some introductions so you know, so everyone knows who's in the room. Uh, my name is Carol Fulkerson. Uh, I am a person with multiple sclerosis and I volunteer for the Oregon chapter of the National MS Society. I also um, uh, am on the steering committee for the Central Oregon Coalition for Access. And our focus is accessibility in the built environment. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, to those who don't know Joe Viola, um, Chef Fritz just alluded to him, but our thanks to Joe for helping to, because when Joe first heard about this he said, yeah, this is great. And so thank you Joe for all of the work you've done and I understand that you delayed a plane flight today just so you could be here for this. Thank you for that. <laughs> And then Susan Duncan. Um, Susan is the Accessibility Manager at WH Pacific and the former Accessibility Manager for the City of Bend. Susan has great background and experience and she will be doing a good deal of the presentation today. We also have some experts on all of this. Carl Backstrom is a man who uses a wheelchair, so he and Shelley Palmer uh, who uses a power chair will be giving comments and thank you to you. Uh, we have Nancy Stevens who is a person with a vision disability and she is here with her service dog Coco. And uh, we have Ruth um, Higginbach and her husband also helped to help us put this presentation together. Ruth is a person with a hearing disability and she is joined by Sharon Payne who is her American Sign Language interpreter for the day. So our thank you to both um, Ruth and Sharon for the time dedication. We also have Ann Walker, representing disability services for the college. And we have Cheryl Pitkin, who is here uh, assisting also from disability services. So thank, thank you to all of you. We have um, lots to talk about today. It will be, um, a full one hour of information, some experiential, some technical, and then of course hearing the perspectives of our guests who live the life and experience disabilities. Um, I, I want to thank COCC, all of the COCC staff who have the vision, who understood the value and the benefit of this, both for people with disabilities in the community, in the community and also for you as you go forward in your careers. So our obje objectives for today, um, three prime objectives. The first is to enhance your awareness about the Americans with Disabilities Act, and that is a civil rights law. It is just as important as the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So, um, so when you're thinking about the ADA, it is not just a you know, set of guidelines that says the door has to be so wide or that sort of thing. It is a civil rights law. 
Um, we also want to provide you with effective communication tools that you can use when you're interacting, um, both in your personal life and in your professional life, with people with disabilities. And we also want to give you information um, to help you to understand the relationship between the environment and good customer service. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Chef Fritz. Do you have any other comments you want to take or make before we turn it over to Susan? You know, just as Nancy mentioned, the, the goal is to help you better understand not only how to accommodate here in Elevation, but the goal uh, of Cascade Culinary Institute is to give you an education that's transferable to your careers. And this is a reality in the industry. And so we wanted to bring it first and foremost to you, um, and we're recording it for the function of of it helping uh, future students here at Cascade Culinary Institute. The other uh, mention is that if you do have questions, uh, we'd like to hold them till the end. So feel free to write them down and we'll have a Q&A period at the uh, end of the presentation, okay? Thank you, and I just want to reinforce that if you have questions, particularly for our guests with disabilities, this is absolutely the safest environment you're going to run across to be able to ask those questions, so we encourage them. So with that, I'll turn it over to Susan Duncan. And Susan will be leading you through uh, the next part of the, the program. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Carol's already touched on the ADA, so I don't think I need to say anything more about the ADA. So this is an exciting time. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act, you have a handout on. I don't um, think it's worth your time to kind of go through and see if you're following me in my uh, dialogue on this. So I'll just skim some stones over what this civil rights law really means to all of us. It is an anti-discrimination law first and foremost. So as a civil rights law, I think it's important to know that we all are entitled to equality at whatever level that is. Uh, we absolutely have to do our best to uh, make that come together. And that's part of our session for today. The civil rights law has five titles to it. Primarily, we hear mostly about three of the titles. Uh, sometimes you hear about the fourth title. So title number one affects employment. And so as it relates to employment, you absolutely cannot discriminate against a person with a disability as it relates to employment. There's lots and lots of details that uh, relate to that. Um, so just know that when you hear about Title I and being uh, uh, complying with Title I, uh, that, it, that that deals directly with employment. Title II affects uh, different uh, state and local governments. So with the state and local governments, they're to follow what goes on in Title II and, pro and providing programs access um, to services and activities. Uh, the key to a Title II entity, uh, say like with the city or like with the college, um, you work on the program aspect before you work on, say, barrier removal. We're very blessed to have a brand new facility here for you to have for your culinary training versus what the old uh, facility was. And it's fully accessible. It, it went through the process, through the building department and through all the plans and through all the pain that everybody went through to make sure that this was a fully accessible uh, facility. So this is one of the benefits of understanding what the guidance is and the guidelines. So providing a program, um, let's say that this wasn't accessible, we'd need to find a facility within the campus that would be accessible for you all to have your course in uh, to provide equality if we had people with disabilities in the, in the class and do whatever it takes to, to make that be a, a, as equal experience as we could. Title III then is the one that you hear probably a fair amount. Um, is about private businesses. So we've talked about the public sector, this is about the private sector. So restaurants, for example, fall under uh, Title III, and I know that's a topic near and dear to your heart. Uh, so with restaurant uh, activities, making sure that the facility is accessible, and then clearly going into you know to doing the best customer service that you can. With uh, Title II and Title III standards came along with the titles of all the regulations and the details that go into that. And those standards detail out, as Carol was mentioning, you know, 32 inch wide clear width openings for the doorways and 18 inches for this and 44 inches for that. So it's a lot of specification about how we design and how we put our environments together. So both Title II and Title III share the same standards so that we can make sure we have good um, compliant uh, facilities. 
Title IV is about telecommunication, and we're gonna hear more about that from Ruth and from Sharon on uh, the relay system, for, ex for example. And I won't steal the thunder about 7-Eleven, uh, so we'll let them uh, discuss that when they get to that component in the program today. Um, and Title V is miscellaneous, some of the different legal things that go into that. So primarily we've got, uh, you know, really four titles that we work with specifically. And so to know first that it's a civil rights law and then along with that comes these standards that go into uh, getting the built environment uh, compliant. So that's just a quick thumbnail. You've got a very brief overview. The document itself will guide you to ada.gov and we will um, refer to that for you. So should you want to learn more about the civil rights law and have a better understanding of it and the applicability for you in your program and in your career moving forward, feel free to go to ada.gov. So any direct questions on that? We're good for, for that component? Great, okay, so we're gonna move on to the next one, which is your experiential opportunity. In front of you, each of you have your yellow cellophane, so if you wanna pull those out. And you also have your earplug packets. And on each of your tables, you have your decorating fabrics and your paint uh, swatches. We're not going to ask you to do any design work today. We'll hold that to those who do that professionally. We'll let you feed us and uh, make sure we get the proper calorie count in. So if uh, we could start first about how we're going to go through our, our own uh, simulations here. As you know, it's very difficult for us to ever walk in anybody else's shoes, no matter what that is. I mean, you look at a triathlete who knows how to you know, run a triathlete and work the triathlete um, event, I would no more want to try that than the man the moon. Um, and same with preparing some of the dishes that you all know and will learn more about. So for us to do any simulation uh, is truly only that. It's trying to help you understand what happens when the abilities of our body changes and how that's applicable to our environment. So if you pull out your yellow cellophane first, what I'm gonna ask you to do is to uh, look at this as the aging eye. So about age 50, which most of you are much younger than that, yeah. if you look at uh, <laughs> about age 50, the lens of our eye begins to read yellow. So instead of seeing the white documents that are on your table, your name tags, whatever is going on, your white tablecloth, um, it begins to read a little bit more in yellow, as a yellow base. So the yellow cellophane, if you would Find some fabrics on your table, find some paint swatches, exchange with your partners at the table, hold the cellophane right up to your eyes and look at that uh, fabric and see if the color changes for you, see if the fabric design changes for you. Just um, have a moment here where you're just sort of experiencing, make sure that yellow cellophane is right up against your face so you can really read the fabrics and really look at the paint chip colors. And as you're doing that, um, I'll continue to dialogue on the impact of that as it relates to you in this field. As you're looking at these different colors, you've got chairs that you're seated on and it has a fabric to it. You can discern, you can stand up and you can look at the fabric on your chair and you can then look at the horizontal line looking down at the floor, hold the yellow cellophane up and really see the difference between your chair fabric and your carpet fabric. So you can see then, will you be able, if you had some depth perception issues or some vision, um, uh, uh, low vision for example, would you be able to discern that this is the chair? So when you come to seat someone in your restaurant and you say, we'll just have a seat over here, I may not see it. It may completely blend out. What if this was a white back up against the white tablecloth? Would I know that that's where the chair is? Maybe not. So as much contrast as we can do in the environment and as much difference we can make a chair fabric from the floor fabric, same with your tablecloth. Would you want a white tablecloth with a white floor, with your white linens, uh, with your white uh, dishes as well? So begin to think about how color plays a vital role in how we interface with our environments. Um, so that's just sort of getting you started on, on um, thinking about the impact that you could have all the way from the color of your dishes through your linens um, on through those different elements. 
So as you're playing with those, I would also like to invite you to simulate, um, however um, best we can here today, to be able to pull out of your packet the earplugs. So if you'll pull out of your packet the earplugs that we have, we'd like to do a really brief simulation on me um, facilitating a little bit here of being hard of hearing. Um, the packets are a little easier to open. Sometimes we get these models that are really hard to open and you go, well, that's a task unto itself is just opening the packet. So some of you may be familiar with how to um, uh, insert these into your ears to uh, decrease hearing. First, what you do is roll it between your fingers and get a pretty tight cylinder going on with it. So as you're doing that, uh, make it as tight a cylinder as you possibly can. And then I'm going to set the microphone down because I can't do both. What you're going to do is pull up on your ear and turn around and just insert, insert it into your thanks, Carol. Insert it into your ear canal so that it goes in as deep into your ear canal as you possibly can. But you need to pull upwards. You need to, thanks, Carol. You need to pull upwards and pull that earlobe up and out so that you can get that in as far as you can. And I'd like to see you do that in both of your ears, if you would, please. Um, and then have conversation with your partners. So just sit and have regular uh, conversation with both of these and both of your ears. So we'll give you some moments to do that. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I can't hear you at all. <laughs> so feel free to talk across the table to each other, adjacent to each other. Um, it's, it certainly is significantly different than um, than <laughs> having a head cold, I think, when you have both of your ears um, uh, all of a sudden have an element. That's right, I know Nancy said, make noise like you're in a restaurant. Come on, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Isn't that what Barbara Streisand says? Raise the volume, start talking to each other, even talk to your friends across it. That's right, we need all the white noise behind us, the music going on in the background, dishes clanging, tables are being cleared, right? Glasses are being tossed aside. Yes, there you go. And wouldn't you talk there you louder? Go. So we'll do, yeah, make all these noises right here. So talk, talk amongst yourselves then to see some interactions at some of the different tables. Uh, they're not talking. So they're not talking. Come on, talk, 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 talk. Talk okay. loud. There you go. Can you hear what Okay, so let's debrief real quick on this, and let's have a, a few of you share. You could leave one uh, ear plug in if you would like to and leave the other one out. Um, if you want to have me be canceled out altogether, you can leave them both in. That's totally your choice. <laughs> so it's not discriminatory, and I wouldn't take it personally. Um, so have, uh, would some of you please share what that experience was like? You may have done this in the past, but it would be great to share with the group what that experience was like for you. Yes, ma'am? I felt like I was going to be yelling at everybody, yeah. and that made me feel like weird. <laughs> because you would? Just stand out. Stand out, exactly. Oh, and what would happen if you stand out amongst the crowd? Oh, terrible. It would, yeah. So what about others? Thanks for sharing. What about others? What was the experience like? Well, there are certain frequencies that you could pick up easier. I think it was kind of deeper voices you could, you could hear easier than some of the higher pitched ones. Okay. So everybody heard? Did you hear what he said? That it, the frequencies, so the pitches were different, and so he could pick up some versus some other ones? Anybody else want to share? Yes, ma'am. You also feel somewhat dislocated from what's actually happening right there and then. Right. It's, 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 it's hard to describe. Sort of a... Just a dislocation is the best right. description. So the word is dislocated um, from, the, from the conversation. Um, yes. Did any of you go to sort of look at each other's lips to see what somebody was <laughs> trying to say? Yes. This is truth or dare. No, is it true that you did all those raise your hand? No. So you did start looking at each other's lips to see who was talking. Was it difficult when others were talking at the same time and you were just trying to grasp what this one person was trying to say? So compound this, and thank you for doing both of those experiential activities. Um, we appreciate that on behalf of, uh, of the team. 
What happens is you get into a restaurant, as Nancy and Shelley were saying um, all too well, is that there's so much noise in a restaurant, and you get underneath the speaker in the restaurant, and you've got the noise blaring from the music. At the same time, you've got the waiter going, and you're going, I can't hear you. You know, there's nothing coming out of your mouth when in fact I was talking and trying to get your order or trying to bring you a drink or whatever I was trying to do. So it's very important to understand what conversation, what all the other noises are in the room. So as you're laying your rooms out, now what may happen is somebody may come to you and say, I want the quietest table in the restaurant. You probably know right then and there what that means, right? They want someplace acoustically that's got the most uh, level or ability to be able to listen in the conversation and be intimate with the people you've gone with. So in one of the great things about this room is we have carpet on the floor. If we would have held this segment out into the lobby area where it's all hard surfaces, think of the reverberation between the glass windows out there, all the hard surfaces. Again, you moving forward in your career with this you may have input, and if you don't insert yourself into the process to say, I want to have input, and I want my dining experience for my, uh, for my um, clients or customers to be the best they can be and make sure that you can put that in place. Okay? All right. Any questions on that as we move forward to the next segment? All right. The next segment now, we're going to be talking about attitudes and stereotypes. So the next handout you have, again, is just for your reading uh, enjoyment, and maybe on a test later. What do you think, Chef Fritz? <laughs> maybe on a test later as well. So I'm not sure that's going to get him to pay more attention. No. So let's have a little dialogue about uh, stereotypes and um, where we are in our world of you know, that person's tall, and that person wears glasses, and that person, this person, sorts of things. I think it's really easy to begin to label. Um, oftentimes when somebody introduces themselves, you know, it's doctor so-and-so, or that person's a doctor in medicine. And so we want to tag them to either bring them up to a level of, oh my gosh, I need to know that person, they're a chef. Oh my gosh, he's a chef, so I need to know that. Um, instead of just saying, um, this is Jane Doe, um, and she loves sports, or something like that, that we're very quick to want to label people. And I think that's just part of what society has done forever, and I think that's something we'll continue to do. It seems as though, as it relates to persons with disabilities, or people with individual, or individuals with disabilities, is that we're very quick to want to label what the disability is and have that identify who the person is. So if it is a person who is blind, for example, it's a blind man for example. So the disability comes before the person. So all of a sudden, we have tagged or uh, placed uh, some barrier attached to the person, which unbeknownst to us, we just do because that's what we do. Um, there's things in traffic reporting, for example, and they'll say, oh, there's a disabled on the side of the road, and uh, so that needs to be taken care of. Well, oftentimes we hear about the disabled, you know, the disabled are coming today to do this event. Who's the disabled? So, or the handicapped. Uh, so I think it's important that we think about knowledge is powerful. It's important that we understand that there are lots of ways to say things. So we're not asking you just to, today to look at what's politically correct or what's PC, but to heighten your awareness. And one of the ways to do it is to go to the internet, and most importantly is to talk to people with disabilities to get a better understanding of culture within each of those um, uh, disability groups. So there may be a completely different culture in the deaf culture, for example, on the East Coast versus the West Coast. So you may say, oh, well, this is an impaired group versus the other group may say, we're not impaired. We are regular fabrics of, you know, people, fabrics in the society and, um, and we have a right to participate at all levels you know, with everybody else, and so don't count us out. You know, it can be the best chef in the world with my disability, so, you know, don't, don't pigeonhole me and don't, um, you know, make it something different than what it is. So what, what we've shared with you today is a people-first language, and what we mean by that is that we want to encourage you to identify the person first before you then, if you feel you need to. I mean, how many of you go around saying, you know, um, Amy, 
you know, has psoriasis. I mean, it's like, that's kind of Amy's medical diagnosis, right? I mean, do we care Amy has psoriasis? I mean, it's not gonna, it's not gonna involve any discussion amongst us about her psoriasis. So the same comes with what we're trying to do in helping you understand uh, in talking to people with disabilities and relating um, experiences accordingly. So on the back side of your handout, on your person first language, what we want to encourage you to do is to um, address the person first, and then if you absolutely have to bring in um, the medical diagnosis, if you will, which certainly isn't uh, the identifier of who we are, um, then we want to encourage you in the very last page on the um, examples of people first language is people with disabilities and it's instead of instead of saying you know the handicapped or disabled we want to encourage you to say it's people with disabilities so it's a um, more person fit than uh, a title of a group bob has a physical Diagnosis. John is a person who's quadriplegic. Oftentimes you'll hear someone say, oh, so-and-so is a quad, so-and-so is a para. So you hear people who are um, around a lot of people with disabilities, they come up with, you know, so-and-so is a gimp, you know, or they're this or they're that. If that's their language and that's what they're choosing, someone may call and say, hey, I'm a person, um, or, or hey, I want to come in and have dinner at your restaurant, and I have a handicap, so uh, is your restaurant uh, handicap accessible? That's probably not the time where you want to go, you know what, we don't use the word handicap anymore, <laughs> and um, you mean you're a person with a disability, so you don't get into a corrective nature. It's again having that heightened awareness um, as to where that's applicable. Speaking of the word handicap, there's several uh, definitions in history uh, about the word handicap. And so what I'm going to encourage you to use handicap in is in your horse racing, um, in your golf game, and certainly in your bowling. Uh, the rest of the time, you uh, should probably think about not using that word. An element in the environment, like this is an accessible room, so this is an accessible room, we have an accessible parking, we have accessible restrooms. So they're not handicapped restrooms, we don't have handicapped seating, so when you're getting that call from someone or someone coming to your door saying, you know, I want your handicapped seating, they may use that word again, but if you say, oh yes, we have handicapped seating over here for you, think about the, the connotation of what that is. Bottom line is to always be natural and to be responsive uh, to just being yourself. Just be yourself in a conversation. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Learn as much as you can if this is a new arena for you to understand. Um, people, I'm betting you all have relatives that are maybe older, that are hard of hearing, have different vision abilities. You know, we all have diverse abilities and we need to celebrate those and have that be a much more inclusionary environment than what we've we've got. I mean, it's ADA is 1990 is when it came out as a civil rights law and here we are almost 22 years later going, what are we doing and how do we do it? And it's events like this where we get the opportunity to bring that forth to say, here's some things we'd like to just share with you. So um, hopefully we've skimmed a couple stones on that and that gives you some understanding on uh, people first language. And our guests um, on our team will be speaking more to this in a few minutes. Okay, so the next thing I want to share with you are uh, spatial relationships. You'll see Shelby has a power wheelchair. You'll see Nancy has her guide dog with her. You'll see Carl has a manual wheelchair. So when someone says they have an electric chair, I'm gonna caution you to use that, not use that word. That's usually at your end of life that you're seeing the electric wheelchair. So it's a power chair and it's generally battery operated and you recharge the batteries. So there's a big difference in equipment use between a power chair that Shelly has with her joystick and how she maneuvers her wheelchair versus what Carl does with his manual wheelchair. So what I want to introduce you today is how you can lay out your tables and your seating so that not everything's jammed together. And um, our, our team is gonna to talk to you a little bit more about that. This is a template, just a, a throw down floor template. This is the 30 inch width by 48 inch length. This is our standard footprint, if you will, of a wheelchair. So when you're looking at an environment, and I'll just use this here since we have this great play setting, 
You'll see there's a pedestal base on this table, which is uh, probably not the best base, um, and we could get into that at a later date. Um, but right now, this 30 by 48 inch template is right up against the leg of that chair, and it's gonna be hard pressed potentially to get under that table. I mean, it needs to be the right height. But that 48 inches sticks out. So if I'm a person using a wheelchair, I'm gonna be seated about here and I'm in the path of travel. So where people get seated is something that the team is gonna be talking to you more about. The other thing that you wanna make sure that you have is a minimum of a 60 inch diameter. So you wanna have a five foot turning maneuvering space in, in your spaces at all times. So as you're coming up, let's say this is a service bar up here, I don't know if it is, but let's say that this is a service bar up here, that I would want to be able to come up here and turn around and go back in line again and get a, another helping of something that I, that I wanted to have. So I need this maneuvering space. Be very careful about how close you put things together so that you have a good inclusionary activity of all people and regardless of the kind of uh, equipment that's used. So that's a, a quick skim over that. And I think uh, what we'll do running on our schedule here is to look very quickly then um, at our service animal handout. So the last component is the service animal handout. Nancy certainly could speak to this uh, in great depth and uh, with great experience to share with you all. Uh, but what I'm going to do is just tell you that under the ADA we have a new uh, definition of what a service animal is and I just want to introduce you to this is a trained dog. Um, this isn't the ferret, this isn't the snake, this isn't the rabbit, this, all these things that we've used these past many, many years under the ADA were used as uh, service animals. And now it's very specific, right Nancy? It's very specific now is that it must be a trained uh, a dog. And, um, and there's all kinds of good information in here under, uh, under this document that we've given you. The other thing um, that can be used as a service animal is a miniature horse. Now let the crowd have a, uh, really, a miniature horse in our restaurant. So a miniature horse is the other um, animal that would be allowed to be um, a service animal. And so there's guidance on that and specifically how that works. The key thing that you need to know is you cannot discriminate. When a service animal comes to your restaurant, you can't say, oh, I'm sorry, we have health codes here, you can't bring your animal in. Absolutely not, that's discriminatory. So to speak a little bit more about that, but I just want to skim a quick stone over that to let you know that if somebody comes in with a miniature horse, um, at that point in time, you already need to know what this says so you know how to assess that and then what to do in your activities accordingly so that they still can have services provided um, with you know, maybe some different accommodations. Okay? So that's a quick stone over, uh, over that element. So I'm gonna close up mine and pass off to Ann Walker, and she's gonna talk to you about alternate formats. So thank you. Hi, I'm completely uncomfortable with using microphones. This is not something that I ever use, and anytime I do any public speaking, I feel like I'm loud enough that everyone can hear me without. But maybe not. Can you hear me in the back? Oh, that's it's for recording purposes. All right, I'll stick with it. My name is Ann Walker. I am the coordinator of services for students with disabilities here at the college. My primary job is to meet with students, assess their needs according to a documented disability, and what we can do to remove the barriers, allowing them access to all education. Any programs or activities that we provide for the college are also also fall under that same category, not just classroom work. So it includes any outside events, sporting events, um, presentations that come to the campus, we need to make sure that they're accessible for every student according to their needs. It is the student's responsibility to bring that need to me so that we can determine what we can provide for the student. And what I'm just gonna touch on today briefly is just alternate format. And alternate format runs in lots of different um, areas depending on what a student is dealing with. Um, 
a lot of the same kinds of formats are used in the public um, arena as well as the, as the education, but there are some differences in just basically what might be available in your facility. Um, when I, we talk about alter, alternate format, we're looking at how can a printed material be accessible to someone who has a vision disability? Um, how can your, your interactions with people be accessible to a, a person with a hearing disability? So there are lots of different ways that we can bring that and make that accessible to people by these alternate, these alternate forms. Um, for vision disabilities, one of the, the was very primary in the past, it's not as utilized because of our modern technology, but that is Braille, which is a series of dots that, that form the letters and the words that a person moving their hands across these, these symbols can know what, what is being said in that document. Oh, Cheryl's wow. going to be passing around some examples just so you can get a feeling. All of you have seen Braille around. You see it on, on restrooms, on elevators, and in lots of public areas. You see the, the little Braille dots that are saying the same thing that, as what's written on that sign. So having menus, for instance, a menu available in Braille for those who do use Braille <laughs> would be wonderful. It would be a great um, alternate for that person to be able to access the menu on their own without having to have assistance you know, from someone else. Um, another way that, that where the technology has come into play and what I use more, more commonly on this campus for that purpose are, is, is um, digital media. There's electronic text that we can have transferred into to auditory format so that a person can actually hear and listen to the same information that, that a person with vision would read. Small digital recorders, the, a lot of the um, book readers, Kindle, Nook, some of those book readers have the ability to read out loud as well. So having that available in your restaurant might be another alternative. Um, for the person to be able to hear the menu versus reading the menu. Um, I've got one of the examples I, I, I brought, and, and you've got those, those cards that Cheryl passed around, but this is an example of what I have for my, I have a guidebook for students with disabilities, <clears throat> and this is my Braille handbook for that guide. So this has everything in it that the printed book has for a, vision, a person with vision, and they can get the same information out of, out of this handout. So it's just an alternative that's available. Um, another alternative would be large prints change in, in the font size of what you're providing. Some folks aren't completely vision impaired, but have low vision or different levels of vision. So having a font of your menu in different sizes can make a big difference as well. around too. I have examples. I have an intake form that I have students when they first come to my office fill out their personal information, disability information, and, and so I know about them and know where to start to determine what we can provide for them. It's in regular 12 font size, what is typical font for most fields. And then on the back of this, I've raised it to 16 font. So you can see a great difference in what is provided for a person with, with normal vision versus someone who needs, who can't see that. Another alternative, something you could do, have a menu that is, has been expanded in a 16, 18, 20 font size. And we've got some examples of that too, I'll pass around to, to you. You can see the different fonts, if you look, it's each of the paragraphs is written in the different font that would be a possibility. Again, that's something that may or may not be disclosed to you at the time that a person would make a reservation, but if you have those available when they come into your facility, you can have what they need right at your fingertips. Just making their experience that much more enjoyable. Um, I'm gonna to touch a little bit just on communication when, you, when the availability of, of a person being able to call in to your, to your facility to make a reservation, 
may need other options or other, other forms to be able to make that, that contact. A person with a hearing disability would need to use a different type of system. And there are several different, there's, there's the 7-Eleven relay system. It's a system whereby a person calls, dials the 7-Eleven and that's nationally, you, can, you don't have to, wherever you go you can use this system. And it dials you into an organ re, or a, a relay system. I say organ because we're an organ. But a relay system that would allow texting um, communication for the person to be able to understand, to relay what, they're, what they need to say to you and what you're saying back to them through an operator system. There's also another system Ruth's going to talk about a little bit more um, called a, a video relay system where it's literally you see a person using American Sign Language signing the information back and forth between the recipient who has hearing and, and the deaf person making the reservation or making the call. Um, Ruth's going to expand on that a little bit more. Lots of choices, lots of opportunities for us to make sure that what we have available to our clients and our customers is right there. You don't have to be screwing and running around trying to figure out how to, how to make this person's experience the best. You'll have it at your fingertips just by knowing what's available and what, what you can have. And I'm, okay, and I'm going to pass this back to Carol, who's going to introduce our panel of, of folks to talk to you about their specific experiences. Thanks. Thank you very much. So we're going to move into the personal experience, um, the benefit of years of wisdom that our guests have, have acquired, and uh, all for your benefit today. So Carl is going to lead us, uh, and, and then we'll include the others as well. So thank you, Carl. You want to come over too? I think I'll have uh, Carol hand me the mic when it's my turn. Okay. You know, so our perspective is, you know, this is more the actually di the dining experience of, you know, with persons, you know, with various disabilities. We have, a, you know, kind of a broad spectrum here. Um, there's a, a one quick example of a wrong way to do it. I'll go really fast, and then we're going to give some, some good concrete examples of what we go through from making the reservation all the way to paying the bill. Um, it's the and not necessarily the Title Three architectural barriers, but also just how society communicates, you know, how you guys communicate with people with disabilities. You know, how how is that relationship built, and what should be said, and when, and what actions should be uh, taken? And uh, just one example just happened to me last night. I was at a place. I wanted to get a, a some food, and I had a drink. I went to the wheelchair accessible bar area because I was by myself. I was watching a basketball game. And that place was, it had lottery machines, the cash register, and a bunch of marketing material where I was to sit. So I had this much counter space and all, all these wires in front of me. In jest, I said to the lady, um, well, it's great. I have my own personal lottery machines and the cash register. Look at this. I feel special. Well, if you don't like it, you can sit wherever you want. Oh. Was the reply. So we're trying to, you know, we don't want to go that direction. This is an example of the wrong way. Um, I want to introduce Shelly. She's going to uh, talk a little bit about just the reservation process on the phone. Can you hold this for her? I'll put it in my hand. I'm going to move. Actually, that's my driving hand. Do you need assistance? Yes. Would you follow me with this? I'll stop getting okay. Right. okay, now, I'm sorry, Susan, but. I can't resist this pristine piece of paper. <laughs> I'm not, I hope you it's all get about more. It. Okay, <laughs> as you can see, I get up here and my feet hit. Anyway, I'm talking about reservations. It's all about communication. When I call and make a reservation, I tell you what time I'd like to come, how many are in my party, and that I have some special needs. I need a little extra accommodation. At that point, I will say I'd prefer to be at one of your round tables because that puts my knees and my feet farther away from the pedestal. And oftentimes, people say, okay, I guess we can do that. What I'd love to hear is say, 
someone on the other end say, no problem, we can do that. And then when I get there, uh, the night of the reservation, I want that to be noted at the podium for the greeters. So they already know, they're already expecting me. It's a matter of communication. If someone comes in that is disabled and hasn't alerted the wait staff ahead of time, don't assume anything. Take their lead. Ask them how they can best be accommodated. It's, we're all in this together. You want to give us a good dining experience, and we want to experience a fun evening. And the tone can be set at making the reservation. Thank you. And then, uh, Nancy, do you want to speak about uh, the seating as you being sat down to show to your table? Actually, um, maybe. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, if someone calls in as well. So you guys, I'll holler at me for a second so I know where you are. Oh, there you are, okay. Um, so um, if when you start working at a restaurant or you have a restaurant, one thing that's really helpful is if you look, where is the bus stop close to your restaurant? What are some landmarks? Are there steps into your restaurant? Is there a handrail with a distinct feel to it? What does the door feel like? Is there a, a round doorknob? Is it a levered handle? Is there a really cool ornament on your door that you can say, you know what, there's this really cool um, shape. It's, uh, for an example, um, um, what's the name of it? Chow's has that really cool, have you guys been there? has the spoons, the, the forks and stuff. Not that I would necessarily find that, but you know, just things to point out to people. We have a wooden deck when, before you get to the door. And that's a really short sketch of some things that you can tell someone if they say, I'm blind, I'll be taking the bus. How do I find your restaurant? We have a sidewalk or there isn't a sidewalk. You need to come down the street cross at the lighted intersection. There's a, a audible traffic signal if there is. If you can be aware of some of those things that you can describe to someone so that that will help them find your restaurant, that'll be great. Yeah. Do you want me to just do that? Yeah. Okay, okay so I'm gonna talk then about, once I get into the restaurant, um, what, how do you assist me to a table? And the first way, if I forgot to bring my cane, I'm sorry. Um, if someone's using the cane, again, we wanna emphasize the communication like Shelly said, how can I help you? What's the best way I can assist you? And then wait for the answer, <laughs> okay? Um, and so the, if someone's using a cane, what they may want to do is called sighted guide, and Carol's going to assist me. So I would take her elbow. She's a little bit ahead of me. And if it's narrow, you guys got all these tables in here, she's going to put her arm behind her like this. And then I'll just step in behind her and follow her to the table. Okay? And then she can go. And then if it's wide enough, she'll put her arm on front. You can relax your arm. You don't have to be stiff like this or anything. And just let me know if there's a... Uh, table to go around. Once we get to the chair, if you'll just put my hand on the back of the chair so that I know where the table is, where the chair is. She put my hand on the table, but where's the chair? <laughs> She's hiding. I'm going to sit on the table. <laughs> so it's helpful to, to put my hand on the back of the chair and then I'll know where it's at. Um, if um, I have my dog and uh, she might be distracted by the food. I might, want to take a nap here? Come on, stand up. I will put her on a short leash and I'm gonna hold the microphone in this hand for a second. So I may heal her and I'll still take your elbow. And then we're a little wider as you can see. So you still might wanna put your arm behind you and then I'll pull her in behind me. This, sorry, that is so that um, 
I know where her nose is. I don't want her stealing somebody's steak. <laughs> Um, please don't pet the dog. And don't ask me if you can pet the dog because you want to get me to the table quickly and we don't want to have her distracted. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. And, and in, in my situation, uh, think of things, you know, a person in a wheelchair and a manual chair, sometimes I want to actually sit in a booth and transfer. Um, and if, in that case, is there room for me to store my wheelchair close to me where I can reach it? Um, and this, we're going to back up a little bit on the reservation part. Again, you had some assistive technology for the reservations. Okay. Really, really quick on that. Okay. A little bit about the PRS. Uh, I'm used to signing when I talk. I, I can't <laughs> use my voice. So. No. Okay. okay. I'm going to just talk maybe outside with one hand. But um, the deaf, many of the deaf have BRS, which is like a webcam where they call a company member to an interpreter. And the interpreter will show up on the screen. The deaf person will sign to them. The interpreter will call the restaurant and say, we have a reservation for deaf group. And so many, many deaf have that now. Uh, other ways that they'd have a friend call or they would text. I don't know if you can do a text to reserve. I don't know about that. I'm not really, really knowledgeable about all that. But, uh, so okay. that's, that's we also have uh, the, the ordering portion. There's sometimes a customer will have a special request. As you can see, I bring my own cutlery cup and plate with me because it's easier if the food is in a plate with straight sides. In fact, I thought maybe there might be some uh, food hanging around today, so I came prepared. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I will ask when you order, and you will look directly at me, not at my husband. He'll say, I have no idea what she wants. She's already changed her mind three times. When you ask if there's anything special, I will say I'd love to have you cut it up in bite-sized pieces. And what kind of everything boils down to is uh, everyone's going to be different. There's no way we can explain it all right now. This is an eye-opener. And uh, the one thing we emphasize all the time is just, just ask what you can do to help. And just don't assume what we can or cannot do. Um, it's, pretty much it, uh, but we have also the, uh, the paying the bill. You want to speak about that? Yeah, Nancy. There you go. Okay, I, I just wanted to add a couple of things on um, <clears throat> when, is it Kathy? Kathy, I forgot your name. Um, Anne Walker, <laughs> sorry. Um, when Anne was talking about having large print and braille menus, I love it when I get a braille menu in a restaurant because I don't need any technology to read. It's kind of like if you forget your glasses. If you, if you don't know how to use the Kindle or something, then you got to show me how to use it in order for me to listen to it. So I love the low technology type things. Um, sometimes um, we, um, oh, I'll, I'll skip to the paying the bill part. Um, it's really um, helpful if I'm paying with a check or a um, credit card. If you will show me where to sign, please hand the credit card to me if it's mine, not to my friend. Um, and I just want to put a little plug in here at the end of this. There's a song that you can find on YouTube or whatever it's called, Talking Wheelchair Blues. And it's all about an experience in a restaurant. And it's a great song by Fred Small. And it, it sort of sums up, summarizes what you've heard today. And I just, again, Talking Wheelchair Blues, and it's a great song. Okay. Another option, a, a, a tool that can be used to help a person find the spot on a credit card slip to sign is this little template. You would lay on top of the slip, right at the line for the person to sign, and then they can feel 
that edge where to start and they can sign their, their name without having to fumble around trying to figure out where the, where the line is and where they're supposed to sign. Just takes away that discomfort for everybody. About ordering for them, I want I want to say there's a few things you can do to make it more comfortable for deaf people. Do not have tall things in the middle of the table. The deaf people need to see each other's faces and their hands. So I notice you don't really have it here, but I've seen that in restaurants where there's big, and the deaf will always pick it up and move it to another table. So that and also if it's very dark. In the room, that's a difficulty for deaf because they have to see each other. It's very, very important. Um, ordering food, when you as a waiter or waitress come to them, you can, um, there's different ways you can do it. Many deaf will use a little notepad and write down, or they'll point to what they want, or some can talk, like I can talk, some can't. Um, or, um, let's see, maybe they would text it. I don't know, sometimes they would do that. So be careful about making sure you look right at the face, like you were saying about looking at the person when they're talking to them, that is very important. Don't talk to the next person, talk to them. <coughs> and um, look at them, make sure that uh, you have eye contact, you learn maybe a few signs would be awesome. There's like a drink. You want a drink? What do you want to drink? Or uh, are you ready? You ready to order? There's little signs you could learn that would make that effort feel, wow, this is cool. This place knows some sign language. Um, let's see. I can't remember what it was. <coughs> uh, okay. All right, I wish we had more time to share because this is really a four-hour subject to get everything across. But uh, thank you for having us here. We really appreciate that. And uh, I'll leave it with one note. Uh, I, I do get confused when it says, uh, please wait to be seated. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have a sense of humor. Right? <laughs> So before I go into just a couple of quick closing comments, I'd like to know, this is the opportunity, we recall um, Chef Fritz said that if you have any questions throughout this, to jot them down. So if there's any questions, because this is the safest environment to ask them. Uh, does anyone have a question? We've been asked them all before. Yes. Yeah, you won't come up with a new question. So I'll, in order to get the questions recorded, so go ahead and raise your hands and I'll bring the microphone to you to voice the question. Um, hi, I, would, I, did, I didn't hear it, uh, they said anything about people that have mental disabilities, so that's what my question was about mental and uh, physical work. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, there are a broad range of cognitive disabilities, and so all I would say is use your, you know, ask how I can help. Um, can I help you with the menu? Is, wait for the answer, of course. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, courtesy, dignity, use all of that because, again, based on the level of cognitive disability um, will affect how much help they do or do not need. Example. Example? Yeah. I mean, an example of someone has some anxiety disorder or whatever it may be. Um, where are you going to sit them? Maybe in a, a quieter place with less distractions uh, for their dining experience. That would be one out of many of cognitive disabilities. Did that answer your question? Maybe, maybe um, I forgot your name, I'm sorry, I apologize. But the sign language. Ruth. Ruth. Maybe go over a couple signs for us. I've, I've come into a lot of situations where I have um, and people signing, and, I, and I'd love to learn how to sign. I even have a couple books at home, but maybe a couple, um, like, how is everything? Just to make sure, we want to make sure they're taken care of. Is everything okay? What will be the easiest sign for a server to say, tasting well? Something short but simple to make sure they're okay. Okay, everything okay, or okay. If you know the fingers are like, oh, 
okay. Everything okay? Okay. And when you sign your face is your voice, so you have to look like you're asking a question. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you sign, your face is your voice. So this is a little sign language lesson when I'm telling you this, but like I say, okay, you go, okay, and your face looks, you don't say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so your face will express your feelings towards them, and very important. Okay, uh, drink, I said, drink. Do you want, you want a drink? Are you okay? Uh, what was the other one you asked? Uh, Everything, everything, okay? Again, okay? Everything, okay? Um, do you want more, more, <laughs> more drinks or more food? I don't know if you know for that, but. Um, well, how about, uh, so 12? How about like cook 12? Cook, cook, okay? Cook, okay? Cook, okay? And again, question mark on your face. I, you're leaning forward a little bit when you ask questions. I remember uh, when my son was very little, he would say, more milk. More milk. <laughs> more milk. <laughs> yeah. And then please, please, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's all do thank you right now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. With one hand or two. Thank you. Please. And. Uh, your water. 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 Wine. 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 W
you know, and to go for. You know, where is it accommodating? If you will remember that as you move into your careers and make sure that your environment um, can accommodate all people, not just people with disabilities, all people, you'll do very well. So thank you very much to everyone. Um, if you have, you know, if there's an ongoing, uh, yes, thank you. I got hands full. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, if you have an interest in more outreach, if there's more that we can do to assist you um, in your program, please you know, let Chef Fritz know, let Joe Viola know, let uh, college staff know. We're happy to help in any way we can. Hey, if you ever want to serve us a dinner, we'll be happy to test it. But <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you very much. You know, I, I guess I can, you know, the, the day you had Paul Paz here this morning um, from Portland talking about service. And um, I think what this presentation did is it took service uh, from my lens to a whole new level um, and, and the understanding of what service is. And, and that, that spirit of service is so important here at the Cascade Culinary Institute and the curriculum. But, you know, I, I just want to extend a thank you to all of you for taking time out of your schedules, for traveling here this morning, and uh, we very much do look forward to having you back in Elevation and, and being able to serve you um, to the best of our ability. So thank you very much. My name is Holly Conger, and this is my second term in the culinary program. And this was just a great informational um, session learning about different people with disabilities, um, from wheelchair ac access to, um, to the blind, as well as deaf. And um, it was just really giving me um, a better understanding of how to better better serve um, people with disabilities in the restaurant and um, from wheelchair access to be able to um, to assist people um, who are blind um, to um, signing the signing the bill at the, end of the night to be able to be able to help them find the um, find the building um, different landmarks uh, often helps people who are blind find it if they're coming by themselves um, it was really interesting learning about guide dogs and how you should treat guide dogs um, with people who are um, people who are blind and um, you're not supposed to approach the animal, you're supposed to um, approach the person and not the people they are with. Um, I learned a lot about um, just how they want to be treated as people, the respect that we should give them in the restaurant industry, um, and just treating them treating them um, just like just like everybody else. Um, so, so it was a great uh, informational um, time that I learned I learned a lot, and um, it's definitely uh, worth my time. So.